zeros of the zeta function, prime counting, and oscillations of pi of x, the prime counting function at x, across the backbone. In Riemann's singular paper on prime numbers, he introduced a deeply insightful, though non-trivial formula to count primes below a certain number. Though it will forever remain non-trivial, we hopefully introduce a few more insights. His prime counting function is as follows. Uh, here, Li is the log integral, and the summation term is summing over the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. And then there's smaller terms, which we're completely ignoring. In 2012, we showed by construction that the Riemann hypothesis was true by proving that pi at x squared minus the log integral at x squared is absolutely less than uh, plus or minus the log integral at x. Transforming Riemann's equation at um, theta squared equals x, we get the um, following transform, and it's amendable to something in our, our form and the geometry that we studied. Uh, so we wind up with s squeezing the log integral at theta over 2 plus the sum over the zero terms between our bounds. Our study is on the zeros of the zeta term, and we're interested in behavior, not exact results. So we're, we're going to use theta divided by log theta as a proxy for the log integral of theta. This transforms our equation as follows. And note, we get rid of the log integral of half the value. Also note, it remains linear in theta the bounds at least. And we only have to deal with the zeros of the zeta term. However, since we proved the Riemann hypothesis, we know that the real value of all the zeros is exactly one half. So we only need to sum over t, the, the complex component. And we only need to sum over the positive t, because we do so symmetrically and average both. And when we do so, uh, we get rid of the linear term in our bounds. What we have left is purely uh, numbers between minus a half and plus three halves. So we can do another transformation, lifting us from um, the, our current theta to the natural logarithm. And there, when we try to c uh, collect common terms and do a little bit of uh, de Moivre's theorems and the like, and noting some trigonometry, we get this amazing semi-final form. It's purely trig trigonometric, bounded between minus a half and three halves. And uh, hence we see why it's called oscillatory. Remembering that theta squared is equal to x, and noting that twice the logarithm is the logarithm of the thing squared, we get our final form. Um, and we're back at our original x. But keep in mind that the whole time we're measuring our psi of x at pi of x squared minus the log integral at x squared. We are summing only over the, over the positive complex coefficients of the zeros of the zeta function. Now consider that each positive value has an integral part t sub i, the floor of t, and a fractional part t sub f, written with braces. Next, consider another transformation that x equals e to the 2 pi n for some integer n. Large t gives us the following, where we split across, um, we split our, our um, zeros into integer and fractional parts, and then show we only have to deal with the fractional part in the trig functions. Amazing, isn't it? Like, drink it in. That's, that, that's incredible. We only need to calculate the fractional parts for the, to study the random components. And now we have something that we can actually read and get like an intuitive understanding. The first thing we note is if the complex coefficients of the zeros were the positive integers, the first term becomes a mutation of the Basel problem, 
and uh, gives us something about one quarter of pi squared over six for all n, while the second term is zero for all n. That is, the distribution would essentially be structureless and certainly wouldn't have wide scale variation like we see. It would always have to, it would oscillate, but always have to return to uh, these fixed points. It is also noteworthy that at our sample points, all of the randomness is coming from purely from the fr fractional part of T, while the integral part dominates the scaling. That is, we wind up having to divide by t squared and multiply by t, etc. However, the numerator is random valued between minus 1, minus 2t, and 1 plus 2t. But the expectation is zero. So it's reasonable to expect calculating through the first trillion around some n might give a meaningful measurement, at least in deciding which side of the backbone that we're on. Since x is growing exponentially, we can sample extremely fast. Consider the first skews number, estimated to be near uh, e to the 727. That gives us uh, an, our integer value of between, well, our pinning our swing between uh, 115 and 116. That looks like something we can check. We suggest the following test. Calculating this function for all n less than a thousand for all the zeros up to 10 trillion or so. Now remember, you must take special precautions as the fractional part of each zero contains important phase information. So the larger the complex component of the greater the fractional resolution required. That is, you can't just sample um, to 30 digits of precision. When you get to 10 trillion, you've, you've lost uh, 12 digits of precision on your fraction. We're hoping nature doesn't kill us with 10 to the 100 paper cuts. But somehow the last few 10 to the 50 zeros are not as important or certainly not more important than the first 10 to the 10 zeros, especially given the hyperbolic decay of everything. If this is so, nature would have locked in bulk behavior of large swings of our psi of x in the first few zeta zeros, whatever few means. That is, at large scales, <coughs> we expect our scaled psi uh, of uh, pm to be minus a half plus a noise or plus three halves minus noise. Assuming our measurements of uh, this error function represent large-scale behavior of pi of x, the absolute value of a noise term is almost always less than 0.8 log, uh, log integral of x. That is, these assumptions holding true, we have a clear set of, uh, set of clear signatures to look for. Incrementing our n, which shows sudden jumps across a relatively large, ostensibly forbidden region. We conjecture that the first skews number sets the scale, as it were, and we will see the spectrum of jumps randomly valued around this. Just because it's the first thing we see, that somehow must drive nature. But we have no clue about which metric to measure this around. That is, we have no idea which statistic nature chose. The first obvious test is to check our equation at n equals 15 and n equals 16 using an exhaustive set of consecutive zeros looking for the swing. The earlier, the better. Let the largest uh, such t be t naught. Probe past this to something like 10 times t naught and validate that both remain stable. Or the model is wrong, you know. That's what we're looking for. Having collected zeros through 10 to 10 times t naught, probe again for all n less than say 10, 1,000, and find the next crossings if any. Repeat the test at the half integrals and look for sc smaller crossings that may lay hidden. 
and then claim your prize for performing the deepest and largest probe of any structure in human history. Congratulate yourself. Due to our lack of access, whatever your results, please report them via some non-pay-per-view channel. We just we don't have access to that, and we want to know right or wrong. What are you finding? We're profoundly interested in reading your results. Thank you, and please, please do this experiment.